So good, e good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and apologize for some of the technical glitches there, the vagaries of the internet and uh, Zoom connections and all that. It's wonderful to have you here uh, today. We are going to be having our Great Decisions program on the Arctic in just a moment. Uh, I'd just like to welcome you again to this World Oregon webinar as part of the Great Decision series that we do jointly with the Foreign Policy Association. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to purchase the Foreign Policy Association Great Decision Book, we will post the link in the chat. Still not too late to order it or on Amazon, you can get a Kindle edition. Uh, our presenter today will be making some references to the article. So those of you who had a chance to read it, um, he will be uh, referring to that as well. Before we dive in more into today's um, uh, event, just wanted to remind everyone that we are in the midst of our international speaker series. Uh, had a, uh, as we discussed last week, had a fabulous start with Nicole Hannah Jones, the New York Times journalist behind the 1619 project. And we uh, are just excited uh, to be, have the series underway. Our next talk is February 25th with uh, Marn McKenna, a public health journalist and author who will be in conversation with Dr. Marcel Curlin, the OHSU, uh, infectious disease expert who's running the AstraZeneca trial uh, of the COVID-19 vaccine at OHSU. Should be a fascinating and key conversation given that COVID-19 is the issue of our day. Uh, we just announced today that uh, we're launching uh, single ticket sales. So while you can still get a, the three-part series tickets, uh, if you can only make one of the events, uh, single tickets for each event are now on sale. And after I finish making my comments, I will post in the chat uh, the links on where to go to buy those tickets. If you are a, a member, you get 10% off any of your ticket purchases. And if you're not a member, it's not too late to join. So we'll post that link also in the chat on how you can renew or become a member and how you can buy tickets. Um, that is uh, the big event that we have going on in addition to Great Decisions is our International Speaker Series. So we uh, are looking forward to uh, having you there at those events. Um, of course, we're also busy with some of our other events. We have uh, just had yesterday our second part, uh, three or four part culturally relevant teaching series uh, for teachers to help equip them uh, uh, for their work. And our other programs continue to meet virtually with international visitors and youth leaders and others. As uh, uh, I note before every uh, Zoom webinar we do, this uh, Zoom webinar is designed for World Oregon members and other participants. Um, we are recording for posterity, so mind your P's and Q's. Uh, we'll be placing this on YouTube afterwards. And in fact, if you missed a previous talk, uh, especially one of the Great Decision Talks, they are up on our YouTube channel, uh, which you can get through our uh, footer and our website. Um, you can post, as Tim has just noted, uh, you can post questions in the Q&A. Again, please try to post your questions in the Q&A function. It helps us manage the questions easier. And in the chat is where uh, uh, we will be posting links to information that you will find of interest. And now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's speaker who is talking to us about Arctic, the Arctic, and struggles over the melting Arctic. Uh, it is you know, really an honor to have him here. It's someone we've been wanting to have uh, do do this type of event for us for quite a while. And so we're, we're really uh, quite happy that we have this, um, this topic here to discuss today. I'm just going to highlight his bio. He's the executive director of the Arctic Studio, which is a think tank focused on Arctic issues, an adjunct professor of political science at our partner, Portland State University, as well as other colleges in Oregon. He was previously principal analyst for the Arctic at the Office of Naval Intelligence uh, from 2009 to 2014. In that position, he authored original studies on Arctic security and presented regularly to senior leadership throughout the US government. In 2010, he created and for three years managed the US intelligent community's Arctic working group to coordinate national assessments on Arctic surgery, excuse me, Ar Arctic security. He previously served as political military analyst for Russia and Northern Europe at the Office of Naval Intelligence from 2007-2009. He received his master's degree in international studies from the Corbell School of International Studies 
at the University of Denver and his bachelor's degree in history from Vassar College. Uh, again, he has a, a long affiliation with partner universities, ours, a great deal of expertise in this topic, and we're thrilled to have him join us today. Without further ado, uh, Zachary Hamilla, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, all of everyone who's come to uh, hear this talk and hopefully to uh, engage with questions uh, as we as we keep going. I, I think the Arctic is a fascinating and rewardingly complex topic. Um, there's a sense in which when you get into any topic far enough, uh, that becomes true. Uh, the connections become clear. But I, I, I think that the interdisciplinary connections in the Arctic are often evident even earlier. And so it's sort of easier to get into that, that rewarding complexity. Uh, it's at the intersection of geography and climate and politics and economics uh, and, and all, all sorts of other things, uh, indigenous sovereignty, uh, any number of other topics. Um, so I hope you got the chance to read uh, Stephanie uh, Pizard's um, primer on US interests in the region. Um, it's a, a really nice short introduction uh, to the topic. Um, if you didn't read it, don't worry. Uh, it is it is uh, helpful, uh, and I'll refer to it a great deal. But I'm hoping that I can make my my comments flow well, uh, even if you haven't haven't read it. Uh, so I'm going to take it as a starting point, uh, though, um, to uh, take my role. I hope to set some of the dynamics that she talks about into uh, a broader sort of global and economic context. Um, and in part, I'll do that by a critique of some of the argument that she lays out uh, and then hopefully set up some further discussion. Uh, we don't have to just stay on, on that topic when we get into questions. If you have questions about anything Arctic related, uh, you can at least ask uh, and um, we'll see what we can, what we can do. Uh, so her, uh, Stephanie Pizard's chapter, The Coldest War uh, Toward a Return to Great Power Competition in the Arctic. Um, she starts by noting that the US has sometimes been described as a reluctant Arctic nation, um, but that it is, as she says, quickly shifting toward a much more active Arctic policy. Uh, I'll comment very briefly to say that that first half of the remark that it's a reluctant Arctic nations goes right to uh, some of the, the work that I've done with the Arctic studio on the role or the position of the Arctic in US public awareness and uh, sense of national identity. Uh, those of us who've worked on the Arctic for a long time often observe that, that Canadians, not just Canadian politicians, but the Canadian people, the Russian people, um, to some degree, the Norwegian, uh, Norwegians and Danes sort of think of themselves as Arctic nations, uh, but most Americans, uh, the evidence suggests, most Americans don't. Uh, and she's sort of right to highlight that there's a little bit of a, a disparity there. Um, now, this, this increased focus uh, that Pizard is arguing for, uh, she says, finds its origins in the view of the Arctic as an arena for great power competition and she suggests that it's an area where the US risks falling behind. Uh, that is, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a majority view among Arctic analysts, uh, but it is a prominent view. There have been a number of sort of leading articles arguing, uh, arguing that point, not only from press, but also from sort of academics and, and think tank analysts. Um, However, uh, it's, it's important to, to consider the possibility, and even Pizard's phrasing here might suggest it, uh, although she doesn't draw this out explicitly, that the, the competition in the Arctic, uh, such as it is, might reflect global competition. It might just be the local expression of global competition rather than uh, some kind of competition that's being generated by the Arctic or generated within the Arctic. And so as we look at the topic analytically, trying to disentangle what influences are expressing themselves in the region and what influences are, are sort of coming out of the region and influencing world affairs uh, is an important thing to keep in mind. And, and I don't know that there's necessarily definitive answers uh, in most of most of those ways, but you'll you'll probably get the sense as we go along that my view is that most of the security tensions in the Arctic 
uh, are the result of global dynamics expressing themselves in the region rather than the reverse. Uh, but that is, that is very much up for debate. Uh, now, Pizard takes economics to be economic interests to be the driving force for renewed great power interest in the region. So she highlights three economic areas, and I want to spend most of my time uh, before we get to questions sort of talking about those economic analyses or those economic um, potentials for the Arctic. She highlights three, navigation, which is primarily uh, shipping, commercial shipping, uh, new sea lanes uh, or newly opened sea lanes. So navigation, fisheries, and uh, natural resources. And in that case, primarily um, uh, hydrocarbon resource, oil and gas uh, development. So let's start with uh, commercial shipping and navigation. Um, Pizard argues as many uh, people have, have argued, uh, going, going all the way back to um, the late 2000s, there was, a, there was a very prominent New York Times article that sort of tried to make this case that um, climate change and the melting of the Arctic ice, which, which has uh, almost disappeared uh, compared to what it was uh, 20 to, to 30 years ago, um, really uh, is going to create new opportunities for shipping to connect the populated areas of the world. Now that there's a population in the Arctic where there's about 2 million people that live in the Arctic, um, but to connect the, the, you know, Europe, North America and East Asia, essentially. Um, she argues that climate change is going to open significant new routes. Uh, she says on page 45 in the chapter, some sea routes that were only navigable in summer or hardly navigable at all can now be used for longer periods of time. I, I would agree that that is that is certainly uh, the case. She refers in particular to the northern sea route. So the northern sea route is the route that goes across the top of Russia. The northwest passage is the route that goes through the islands at the top of Canada. The uh, transpolar route, uh, which has never yet been open, would be straight over the North Pole, more or less. Um, but uh, even with climate change at the to the degree that we have it, um, it that has not yet been ice free, uh, even even at the height of summer. Uh, that the transpolar route is still um, not not quite viable, unless you're an ice strengthened uh, ship, of which there are not many. Um, so Pizard highlights that the Northern Sea Route represents a shorter route between Europe and Asia, cutting trips. <clears throat> cutting trips by several days and avoiding some potentially dangerous areas such as the Strait of Malacca, uh, the Strait of Malacca in, in between um, Malaysia and Indonesia in Southeast Asia. So she notes that um, as of 2020, this shipping route was still more of a trickle than a highway. So she's, she, she recognizes she's talking about potential. Um, she notes that there were 27 ships that made a complete transit across the top of Russia in 2018, which was actually down from 31 in 2014. Uh, and she suggests, for example, that because chunks of melting sea ice make for treacherous waters, uh, it still hasn't gotten a huge amount of use. Um, but that because the sea ice continues to disappear, uh, and in fact, it is disappearing faster than the best estimates thought it would just 10 years ago, um, so will these obstacles also disappear, she suggests. So I'd like to, to give you a little bit of a, a global analysis of that argument. Um, and one of the crucial missing elements as we think about this, this what is the potential for Arctic shipping and over what time frame uh, might there be potential? Uh, there's a number of inhibiting factors uh, that, that she doesn't get into in part because there's just not the space and that's why we're here. So one key thing to think about is the difference between the global context and the local context. Uh, how many ships is really significant um, when, we, when we think about it from the perspective of a small port town in Northern Russia, uh, an increase from 30 ships let's say uh, last year or the year before, up to 500 ships would be a huge difference, 
right, for a small town um, in a remote location, but would even 500 ships make a big difference in global, in the global scale? Uh, and so the first thing is the consider the total numbers for the Northern Sea Route, the NSR, uh, I'll use that acronym. Um, Pizard notes there have been about 30 in recent years. Just last year, that was actually up to um, over 60. Uh, but that was still less than the peak of more than 70 ships that transited in the early 2010s. Um, more importantly, though, compare that, that the, the, the highest it's been has been 70 transits. Uh, compare that to 12,000 transits every year through this, the Panama Canal. And in a good year, about 20,000 transits through the Suez Canal. And uh, you're really looking at, at the Suez Canal would be the main competitor connecting Europe and East Asia, competitor to the Northern Sea Route over Russia, that is. And so the, the activity in the Arctic would, would have to grow just tremendously before it would really register on the global shipping scale. Uh, especially in comparison to something like Suez. And the Strait of Malacca actually, which, which uh, Pizard mentions actually gets even more, uh, more transit activity than, than Suez. Um, total cargo volume. Uh, so if we're thinking about the Northern Sea Route, the Arctic shipping route, not just in terms of its complete transits, but in terms of how much cargo is being moved in those transits, and how much cargo is being moved in and out of destinations in Russia. Um, we, have all, we have seen record numbers there, uh, but it was only just about four years ago, I believe, it might've even been three years ago, uh, was the first time that the total cargo volume shipped exceeded its previous peak in the 1980s. The Soviet Union had a very robust um, cargo shipping uh, operation on the Northern Sea Route uh, to and from our parts of Arctic Russia. And um, up until just a couple years ago, all that change uh, from climate change in terms of ice cover still had not compensated for the collapse of the Soviet Union in terms of its economy. Um, so all of this is not to say that, that it couldn't expand or that it, it, it can't grow, but just that that in terms of its global importance, I think we're looking at a longer time horizon. Um, now, some countries plan for very long time horizons. So that, that is also not to say that there couldn't be tension over it, especially because there are disagreements over whether or not certain parts of the Northern Sea Route are international straits uh, used for international navigation, freedom of navigation, or whether they are in fact Russian internal waters in a way where Russia, as Russia claims, could restrict transit passage. But there's a second category of analysis to thinking about the potential for Arctic shipping. It's very easy to read accounts like Pizard's um, here with respect to shipping and end up feeling a little bit optimistic about that growth. So consider a few baseline challenges, which doesn't, again, is not to say they couldn't be overcome, but consider a few baseline challenges. First, distances uh, do not actually always favor the Arctic. Um, the Northern Sea Route uh, is, is certainly the more favorable um, uh, comparing it to the Canadian side uh, for a variety of reasons, including distance. But if you're looking to ship goods from East Asia to Europe, um, if you're going from basically anywhere in East Asia and your destination is in the Mediterranean Sea, so if you're going to Marseille, uh, which uh, I haven't looked at the figures for the last couple of years, but is historically been one of the five largest ports in Europe. Um, if you're going to Marseille or if you're dropping off in Italy or Greece um, or, or Spain, it's not even shorter to go through the Arctic. Uh, it's really only shorter to go through the Arctic if your destination is in Northern Europe. Um, and, if, and likewise, if you're coming out of Southern East Asia, um, it's, a, it's also not shorter even if you're going to uh, Northern Europe. So for example, connecting Singapore, uh, which is depending on the year, the, the largest or the second largest port in the world. Uh, if you're connecting Singapore to Rotterdam, the largest port in Europe, 
um, it's shorter to go through the Suez Canal. Um, and so you're not, you're not likely to be saving fuel just on the distance, uh, which is usually the calculation that we see. Inland logistics uh, create conventional lock-in, right? It's not enough to have a, a transit. You have to have ports where you can move goods um, in and out. And so if, if we're thinking about it from that perspective, you know, you can shift cargo to northern ports, but you have to build those ports up to handle that level of cargo and you have to build up the rail and the surface transportation to move cargo to and from those ports. Um, the, 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 the example in North America on the eastern seaboard is that the big ports of North America are mostly in the Gulf Coast because of um, moving, um, especially moving hydrocarbons. Uh, and the, from the Gulf Coast, it, going to Asia, it's always shorter to go through Panama Canal. You'd have to get up to sort of Virginia and points north, um, New York, the port of New York, um, before you Boston, before you start to even see a distance benefit for the Arctic. But New York, Boston, Duluth, Minnesota, um, they no longer have the inland logistics to support that kind of throughput. So there's a little bit of lock-in on conventional routes. And with respect to that infrastructure investments, uh, those infrastructure investments, one of the things to consider is that the, the cargo sh shipping in the Arctic is gonna continue to be um, seasonal. Uh, someone years ago, it's years ago now, so it's even possible the science has changed, but somebody years ago said uh, at the State Department um, remarked to me that nobody is forecasting ice-free Arctic winters while the earth is still habitable. Um, and, and that's not to say that we couldn't adapt and survive even in that situation, but uh, basically the Arctic will remain covered in ice during the winter, even if we see ice-free Arctic summers. Um, and that ice will be thinner and easier to break through if you're an icebreaker, but it'll still be there. Uh, and so you're looking mainly at a seasonal proposition with respect to Arctic shipping, and that impedes the infrastructure investment for northern ports if you're only going to be able to use them for three or even five months out of the year. Uh, there will continue to be environmental hazards, even in the summer. Um, there's a lot of factors there we won't we can go into more if you're if you're interested in questions. Uh, the last thing to say on that, though, is that uh, there is also a, a gigantic difference in the way that global shipping operates bulk cargo and containerized cargo. Uh, and so containers operate on a hub and spoke model um, and it's intermodal. So the containers that you see on trucks and on trains are the same containers that get moved onto ships. And uh, basically, uh, ships, car, container ships move around the world and small ones, sort of like air, airplanes, small container ships bring cargo to a nearby hub. And then large container ships basically do circuits around the, the major ports of the world, picking up and dropping off cargo at each stop. So if you're taking a container ship from Hong Kong to Rotterdam and you go through the Arctic, there's really nowhere to stop along the way and, and move move cargo off and on the ship. So everything on your ship, you have to fill it and it all has to be going basically to Northwestern Europe. But if you take the Suez, then that ship can stop along the way in Singapore and Dubai and at Suez and in Marseille and in India and any number of and Goa in any number of other um, locations along the way. And so there's systemic efficiency to taking Southern routes as a containerized transport, even if it's actually slightly longer uh, in terms of distance. That's not true, or certainly not true to the remotely the same degree for bulk cargo. And so for the Arctic route, there could be the potential for greater bulk, bulk cargo. Um, that's why four out of the five largest container shipping companies in the world have all said explicitly that they do not plan to use the Arctic routes anytime soon. Uh, that, that's Maersk, MSC, uh, Mediterranean Shipping Corporation, um, Hapag Lloyd, and CMA. Well, CMA stands for, it's a French uh, shipping company. Um, the, only, the only one that's really showing interest is the Chinese, uh, Costco uh, shipping company, which is the largest Chinese shipping company. Um, so 
thinking about all of that, putting that all together, uh, the, the potential for Arctic shipping over the next decade, maybe two decades, um, seems to me to be still rather limited, um, which isn't to say that it couldn't be a lot more if the transpolar route opens right over the North Pole 30 years from now, um, becomes a larger portion of the year it's open. Um, and it also doesn't mean that, that there might not be some tension, but usually if we're gonna see tension, geopolitical tension, turn into a real flashpoint, um, we're looking at smaller timeframes than that and a greater importance in terms of total economic activity, global economic activity. Um, I won't talk as long about fishing and hydrocarbons. Um, so just brief remarks about each of those. Um, fishing, uh, in the Arctic, which is um, Pizad's, uh, Pizad's uh, second uh, economic um, focus, uh, is already pretty important. Um, and, and if you include the sort of the near Arctic, the Bering Sea, um, the the uh, um, the area off of Labrador, south of Greenland, um, you end up seeing a, a lot of of global commercial shipping is already happening in and near the Arctic. Um, there are declining fish stocks elsewhere in the world. Uh, however, the caveat here is that most of the Arctic, uh, most of the, the maritime Arctic is covered by already recognized and undisputed exclusive economic zones. Uh, Pizard mentions uh, in, the, in the chapter that exclusive economic zones give coastal states rights to the maritime resources, both water and seabed, up to 200 nautical miles offshore. Um, that does not constrain freedom of navigation, but it does constrain foreign ships from fishing and extracting uh, seabed resources without permission. Um, and all of the Arctic states have relatively uh, well-developed coast guards and surveillance capabilities. And so we're not likely to see the same scale of secretive illegal fishing um, that we, we see in you know, the Indian Ocean uh, or, or off of Africa and certain parts of Southeast Asia, uh, or even just out in the Pacific. Um, so most of the fishing in the Arctic is already spoken for. Uh, now that should give you a little a little preview of, of the same argument is largely gonna to apply to hydrocarbons offshore. Um, now, uh, Pizard cites uh, the US Geological Survey's 2008 um, hydrocarbon estimates. This is, it's, it's been 12 years and this is still the best comprehensive assessment of hydrocarbon potential in the Arctic. Um, so she's right to refer to it. She says on page 46 that the USGS described the Arctic as an immense reservoir of natural resources, noting that 90 billion barrels of oil, um, 1,669 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 44 billion barrels of natural gas liquids may remain to be found in the Arctic. Um, most of it offshore. Now, there's a couple things to say here. One is that this and ev virtually every other estimate of offshore hydrocarbon resources in the Arctic um, includes wild uncertainty. Uh, we've barely mapped the seafloor in the Arctic, let alone done sufficient work to really understand what oil and gas resources might be there. And the USGS report, in part because of um, being poorly characterized in press over many years has built up this reputation for having said that there was a certain amount of natural resources. But the USGS, of course, is a scientific organization and what they actually provided was a probabilistic estimate. So for example, uh, what the USGS uh, actually said was that, um, for example, in Baffin Bay, which is uh, in between Greenland and Canada, there was a 95% chance that there's at least zero barrels of, of oil and a 5% chance that there could be as many as 34,000 million barrels of oil. And their range of possible estimates with this really wide standard deviation um, applies to pretty much everywhere offshore in the Arctic. Uh, we really don't know how much there is up there. There could be a lot of oil and gas up there, and there might not be. Uh, and we know, as Pizard says, that it's very hard to get it, to extract it. Um, and there have been, there have been times when uh, companies have, have invested millions of dollars exploring offshore off of Greenland, 
uh, north of Alaska uh, about eight, eight ish years ago, um, shell off of Alaska, and they have not found uh, meaningful amounts of recoverable hydrocarbons in places they expected to find them. Uh, so we really don't know. Um, and, and uncertainty, of course, can create risk uh, and it can create geopolitical risk. Uh, but then we get to the second point. And the second point is that as best we can estimate where these resources are, they are almost entirely in already uh, recognized and undisputed exclusive economic zones. Uh, these hydrocarbon resources are much more likely to exist near shore rather than out in the middle of the Arctic basin, uh, which is the area being subjected to the extended continental shelf claims. Um, and it's true that those extended continental shelf claims do overlap. Um, uh, and we can talk about that in more detail later on if you like, uh, but pretty much um, you're looking at all of the all of the likely oil and gas resources in the Arctic are pretty much already spoken for. And the areas in the exclusive economic zones that are still in dispute are pretty small. And those disputes have been tremendously well managed uh, by the participating states who all, even Russia, who all sort of share a, a common understanding of international law uh, especially as it applies to um, exclusive economic zones and, and the law of the sea. Uh, of course, the only Arctic state that has not yet ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is the United States. Uh, China as well has ratified the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So um, that, that is a perennial issue um, for policy debate as well, is, is what's the role of, of US ratification uh, for that treaty. So with these three areas of economic interest in mind, um, as I said, I wanted to mainly focus on those because those are the area um, that are sort of subject themselves most, I think, most interestingly to the global perspective and, and a little bit of, of additional detail. Um, Pizard argues then from that basis of economic uh, interests uh, to the renewed strategic interest of the various nations. Um, she notes uh, the Arctic Council as a peaceful forum, but a limited forum, um, and uh, a high degree of international cooperation. Uh, she refers to this idea of Arctic exceptionalism, that, that somehow, even when there's even when there's disputes and tension elsewhere, cooperation in the Arctic somehow continues. And we can, if, you, if you're interested, we can, we can sort of try to address why that has been the case um, and, and why that has not been the case in, in certain other parts of the, the world, that even other parts of the world that involve the same countries, such as the Black Sea region um, and uh, for, with Ukraine, for example. Um, now, Pizard argues that US policy toward the Arctic experienced a significant turn in 2018-2019 with the region becoming increasingly described as a theater of global strategic competition. Uh, I agree that there, there, is, uh, there has been a, a shift in US rhetoric uh, over the past three-ish years. Um, attention to the Arctic sort of be began ramping up. It goes through phases of, of renewed interest every 15 to 20 years or so, began ramping up again around 2007 uh, when there was a huge decrease in sea ice. Uh, that, uh, so suddenly everyone paid attention because it looked like the ice was just going to vanish overnight. Uh, and it almost did. Uh, and also the same year, uh, 2007, the Russians sent a submarine to the, under the under the ice to the North Pole and planted a little titanium flag on the seabed um, as if they were, people said, as if they were claiming it. And every indication is that, that is, they were not claiming the North Pole in any kind of flag planting sense, but much like when the US landed on the moon and put up a flag, it was more like a, wow, look what we can do. And it was in fact a rather uh, technically impressive feat to put a flag on the seabed under the North Pole. Now, that ramping up of attention led into, in 2015, the US took over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which happens about every 15, every 16 years, I think it is. 
Um, so it, it was sort of this period of attention. So George W. Bush administration issued a, the first national Arctic policy uh, update in, it was at least a decade uh, in 2009. It, it had been the 1990s, the last time a document like that was issued. Uh, and then the Obama administration accepted that policy and continued to work from there. Pizard highlights a number of shifts in US posture, or at least US rhetoric. Um, and it's really only been in the last year, year and a half that we're seeing more concrete, uh, we've seen more concrete moves. Uh, but um, she cites some statements from Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State under President Trump, um, President Trump's own reported interest in buying Greenland from the Danes uh, and renewed interest in um, the US building more icebreakers for the US Coast Guard, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a few other examples in there. Um, I, would, I would suggest to you, however, that uh, we, we be cautious in interpreting that as a long-term reorientation of US policy. Uh, for the first two years of the Trump administration, uh, President Trump and, and all of his uh, staff, uh, except for the very beginning when we were finishing chairmanship of the Arctic Council for the sort of the first four months or so of his presidency. Uh, after that, it was largely ignored uh, and um, major key positions uh, were, were allowed to lapse and so forth. Um, this renewed interest uh, also, I would suggest, reflects the uh, sort of hawkish and China skeptical uh, position of the Trump administration and its staff more broadly. Uh, and so as we're now, as we've now seen the results of the election uh, and, and President Biden has come in, uh, I think that we will see, I mean, sort of, it's sort of a little bit obvious that we would see some return to the policies of the administration in which he was the vice president. Uh, but more broadly, um, it, we're sort of seeing a return to the policies, the kinds of Arctic policies that, or I expect we will, um, the kinds of Arctic policies that uh, have, have had continuity since the last few years of the George W. Bush administration. Um, and, and the question really is, will future presidents after President Biden, um, especially uh, you know, future Republican presidents, will we see a, a sort of reorientation and, and continued attention in that regard? Uh, now, I, I'm going uh, to sort of s s more or less stop there um, to make sure that we have enough time for, for some questions. And I know that I, I've sort of left out the detailed analysis of a number of things, including the Russian and Chinese positions. Um, but uh, Pizard sort of mentioned some of those and hopefully that, that gives you some basis for, for questions. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about those as well. Um, so with that, uh, why don't we, um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to our, our hosts to sort of moderate uh, discussion. Uh, or, or the questions, um, and, and or, or let me know if you just want me to, to take a look at the questions sort of in hey, order. No, um, thank you so much, Zach. This is Tim DeRoche, the Director of Programs. Interestingly, the way you ended um, uh, led right into my first question, which is what do we need to understand about the Chinese-Russian, uh, is it a partnership, is it an alliance? Um, how, how, do we, how do we read that? Uh, I, I would I would say that the Chinese Russian relationship is um, I mean it's is intensely complex. I would not characterize it as an alliance. Um, I think that these are these are countries whose who who share some interests at the global level, uh, but who also have a lot of competing interests themselves. Quite quite regardless of the United States, uh, and. In fact, I, I would say that that a lot of the that a lot of those tensions between China and Russia themselves can be seen in the Arctic. Um, you know, R Russia is rather protective uh, of its part portion of the Arctic, uh, and I think U.S. policymakers would say even a little beyond its portion of the Arctic. Um, Russia, I would say, Russia has a worldview in general which restricts legitimate 
international participation to countries located in a region. And so one of the reasons why the Russians have been so vehemently opposed to US involvement in uh, say the Black Sea region is that the US is not, doesn't have any territory nearby. It's as though the US is coming into an area where it has no business and it's mucking about. Whereas the US has very legitimate presence because of Alaska in the Arctic. And I think the Russian, Russian international relations intuition uh, gives greater credence to US participation in Arctic events, forums, and presence because of that. And so the Russian intuition I would suggest to you would see China in this sense a little bit as a threat, um, or at least as an unknown and as a rising power that might threaten Russia's position. But at the same time, if Russia is going to develop, uh, economically develop its Arctic uh, or redevelop it from the Soviet era and then exceed that development, it's gonna need a market for those hydrocarbons and, and China is a great market. And China has showed the greatest interest in shipping uh, through the Northern Sea Route and has abided by all of Russia's additional rules, which gives legitimacy to Russia's interpretation of international law with respect to a, the transit passage through, through straits uh, or not uh, on the Northern Sea Route. Uh, so, so there are incentives for cooperation there, but also I think a sort of a deep skepticism on the Russian side. Um, for China, you know, I, I would suggest to you that, that for China, the Arctic is primarily the expression of its, uh, we're, we see its behavior in the Arctic very similar to its behavior anywhere else in the world. Investing, investing in infrastructure, uh, interested in, in controlling, uh, protecting, I should say, protecting shipping lanes. Um, it's not really trying to control shipping lanes uh, far yeah. afield. Um, protecting shipping lanes, uh, protecting its supply of natural resources, diversifying its supply of natural resources. Um, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, building infrastructure, um, and uh, you know, I think we 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 could see some of the same sort of suspicious activity from China uh, that we see elsewhere in the world as well. But it's not sort sort of not Arctic specific. Um, that that's kind of just how a rising power and a Chinese rising power um, sort of treat treat the world generally is, is as a place for investment and activity. Um, cooperation between them has been um, tentative at, at, at best, to go back to that original question. Well, so on the question of, um, <clears throat> pardon me, of mucking about, uh, James Banford wrote a great piece in foreign policy, maybe five, six years ago, um, about the, the rising spy war in the Arctic, is this still a concern? And do you see, because you mentioned um, the Straits, do you see the Bering or even the Davis Strait becoming strategic flashpoints? Um, on the, to the first half of that question, uh, I don't know if I'm well enough informed uh, to, to comment to comment effectively on it. Um, I my my suspicion would be that it is. Uh, is it would be, I mean, I, this is this is kind of an easy answer, but that it would be similar to anywhere else in the world um, or, or similar to in, in focus uh, to elsewhere, except of course that uh, in the Arctic, you're dealing with uh, a set of countries that are that all have pretty robust technological uh, and for that matter, technological capabilities and for that matter, uh, intelligence espionage traditions. Um, and Russia, uh, at, at least, has a, a, a sort of an interesting, per, another sort of intuition about international relations, I think, for Russia is that uh, Russia has, as a country, historically identified what it refers to as the near abroad, and that uh, it pays closer attention in a variety of ways to the near abroad than it does uh, or more consistent attention than it does to, to places farther afield. Um, but, but I don't know, don't know how much I can, I can say to that. Um, 
I don't recall the specific article uh, that that you mentioned. Um, so if, if you want to follow up, uh, go ahead. For the Bering uh, or the Davis Strait, um, uh, on, to start out with, uh, I, I don't see the Davis Strait uh, being particularly uh, crucial. Um, it, it, there's just not enough sort of wait. Or maybe now I'm now I'm I'm questioning myself as to exactly if I've got the right location. Um, uh, enough uh, likely um, sort of passage there relative to the space or something. Um, the bearing, uh, however, the bearing straight, you know, anything going to and from the Pacific is going to go through the bearing straight if it's going to the Arctic, right? So. Um, any shipping route through the Arctic is going to involve the Bering Strait. And the Bering Strait is quite narrow. Um, I mean, it's big enough that you're not gonna, you're not gonna run into each other as long as there's a decent, uh, a decent uh, navigation control regime. But um, it is narrow enough that it could be a strategic flashpoint. Although just that, I, that, I, that notion of a strategic flashpoint um, we'd have to develop exactly what we mean by that. Because that's a phrase that people use to mean, I would say a variety of different things. Um, if we mean flashpoint in the sense of, you know, the, the, the trigger for armed conflict, um, I would say that we are, we are far away from that, which isn't to say that it couldn't happen, uh, especially over a period of decades. And especially if global relations between the US and either Russia mainly, or maybe China, uh, were to deteriorate substantially. But US-Russia relations in the Arctic have generally been good and, the re and relations in the Bering Strait region have been even better. Um, the US Coast Guard and the Russian Coast Guard and Border Guard have a tremendously good cooperation there in a way that we tend not to see almost anywhere else. Uh, they just conducted joint patrols uh, a month or two ago, uh, or a couple months ago. Um, uh, there's been a new uh, agreement signed between the two countries governing uh, patrols in the or um, response in the area. Uh, there's traffic separation scheme develop in development, uh, and the delimitation line between the two countries in, in that area is essentially settled. Uh, so uh, the Bering Strait is sort of has that potential, but it's also at the same time very well managed uh, and with a lot of institutional sort of weight behind that management. Uh, so I, I think it, it could, uh, but I'm, I'm not, that, that is not where I would, I would look to for sort of the, the in Arctic flashpoint. So here's a question um, climate related. Does the prospect of global warming bringing agricultural production farther north in Canada and Siberia impact your projection of infrastructure development and export markets to be served in those areas? Um, less so for Canada, um, in part because Canadian uh, Canadian export um, through that, through, through those northern, those, the northern route would probably be harder than through the southern, the southern routes. Um, in Russia, of course, uh, and, and this is true to a lesser degree in Canada and a little farther north, but in Russia, all the rivers flow north, right? So if you go out across Siberia, um, you know, it's, it's one large river after another that all empty into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and that has historically been used as for transportation, uh, right? Natural resource extraction. Um, I, my impression, however, is that in terms of a, a meaningful, a shift of meaningful distance north from existing agricultural areas uh, to make it, to make a big impact on Arctic sort of population uh, demographic population, uh, industrial activity, port infrastructure, um, that, that we need to be looking out, you know, 50 to 100 years or more, uh, even with the amount of warming that is currently projected. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not 
my specialty has never been the the science behind the climate science. One of the wonderful things about my uh, my work on the Arctic has been that uh, I've just been able to ask the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or the oceanographer of the Navy to to give me their best climate estimates, and then I I've gotten to just use those. Um, uh, I, I'm a proponent of of letting letting that. Uh, <laughs> Um, letting the experts uh, estimate their thing. Um, but but from what I've heard and what I've continued to read over the last uh, couple of years, uh, especially the last um, IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, report, uh, is that, you know, to, yes, agriculture will become more viable a little farther north, but that'll be a very slow process. Uh, and for that process to then yield a huge uh, change in, in infrastructure or population, um, we're, looking, we're looking pretty far into the future. So could you maybe speak about some of the pressing issues for indigenous peoples in the Arctic? And are there any issues in common with the tribes in the rest of the US? And do indigenous peoples in the Arctic have different policy goals from one another? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best on that. Um, the that that was I, I thought you know it's it's in my in my notes here I thought that was probably the most important topic that that uh, our chapter didn't cover uh, is um, indigenous uh, sovereignty or indigenous peoples and, and sovereignty in the Arctic. Um, so you you mentioned a sort of Alaska or or the contrast with the rest of the United tribes in the rest of the United States. Um, so if we think about it from within the United States, comparing Alaska and, and the lower 48, um, native peoples in Alaska are, are, are sort of under a, a substantially different legal regime than uh, tribes in the, in the lower 48. There are not reservations. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a, a huge transfer of, of money uh, uh, around 50 years ago, uh, as well as the establishment of chartered corporations, which own a variety of assets, um, corporations owned by the indig indigenous Alaskans, um, it, it, which sort of, it's a very different environment. Um, so the comparability is, is low. The indigenous peoples Arctic wide, including Alaska um, have been significantly in, invested in the international relations uh, of the Arctic in a way that is usually not true elsewhere in the world. The Arctic Council is the, the only um, international organization uh, that has a special category of membership for indigenous organizations. Um, and so the Arctic Council is comprised of eight nation state members, that is the countries that have territory, land territory above the Arctic Circle. And then I believe it's six um, permanent participants, each of which is a, uh, and I think five of which are international native organizations and the, the, the sixth of which is a native organization that is, spans a large part of Russia. Um, in terms of the, the peoples that comprise it. And so the Inuit Circumpolar Council uh, is, is one of these organizations um, with membership uh, that, that, that crosses, I believe, crosses Greenland, Canada, and uh, parts of Alaska, and possibly into a little bit into Siberia, but I can't now remember. Um, these organizations speaking on behalf of the native peoples are involved in every Arctic Council meeting, uh, in, in the Arctic Council working groups as, as if they were full members of the organization, uh, except for the final mm -hmm. voting rights. Um, now, that, e even that is quite unusual. Uh, as I said, I, I, I believe it's the only international organization with that format. Um, the other category, since I'm talking about the Arctic Council, the other category of, part, of sort of participant, as it were, in the Arctic Council are observers. And there are something on the order of 20 to 30-ish observers, um, many of whom are nation states, and many of which are international organizations 
uh, such as the, the most recent uh, applicant to become an observer. Uh, the most, I think the, the two most recent applicants to become observers are the country of Estonia and the International Maritime Organization. Um, China and uh, Japan and South Korea became observers about seven ish, seven or eight years ago. Um, so Inuit uh, and, and other native people, native indigenous people sovereignty in the Arctic uh, is of crucial importance because those, that sovereignty has, has historically extended not only on land where it is generally um, been managed or, or, or um, engaged with by each of the nation states individually, uh, but it's also extended offshore in various ways, in different ways in different countries. Um, and uh, so for a great example here is there is a maritime boundary dispute between the United States and Canada along the boundary uh, from Alaska to the Yukon territory, essentially, which where you know, they agree, the countries agree on the land boundary, but when the, the land gets to the water, they claim different parts of the water as part of their internal waters and their exclusive economic zone. However, there, there are in, internal Canadian, the, the Canadian government has internally recognized native sovereignty offshore in that disputed area. Um, a, a variety of rights native rights. And so resolving that boundary dispute at the international level becomes a lot more complicated. Um, so the, the indigenous peoples in the Arctic, uh, I, I suggest, um, and, and you should obviously ask them, um, but I suggest uh, have a, a greater voice at the international level uh, than we see for most indigenous peoples um, in other parts of the world. Uh, um, except, of course, in instances where um, Native peoples are, are sort of maintained sovereignty in, in their own land uh, at, the, at the level of international relations. Um, and to some degree, that's happened with, with Greenland, uh, which has gained increasing amounts of autonomy from Denmark over time uh, and is um, substantially uh, running its own affairs now, as well as about uh, 20 years ago, the creation of a new Canadian territory, Nunavut, uh, in order to essentially um, give Inuit their own territory within, within Canada. Um, how, that, how that's all worked out is, is uh, a, further, a further discussion that, that I would need to read up a little bit more on. Um, but there's, there's a, lot of, a lot more influence there than there are in a lot of other cases. So Zach, we're coming up on our time. I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, the Arctic is sort of, you know, it occupies, I think, a sort of terra incognita in most people's heads. It's, uh, you know, it's the North Pole. Um, and this question, this last question may not seem very obvious to a lot of people, but how much land is under the ice and where is it? Um, so that's the, the great difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic. The quip has it that the Antarctic is land surrounded by an ocean. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land. So uh, primarily, when you look down at the top of the world, you've got a large ocean, ocean basin surrounded by land. Um, and the Arctic, uh, the Arctic Ocean, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I might get this, I'm, I'm like, I feel like I'm likely to get the size wrong, but it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of three times the size, three or four times the size of the Mediterranean Sea. You can look that up. Um, but it's basically, it's an ocean surrounded by land. So when you look down, um, the areas that are, the areas of land that are covered in ice are essentially most of Greenland uh, and some of the northern Canadian islands. There are some glaciers in a few other locations. There's a little bit of an ice cap on Svalbard, which is a, an archipelago of Norwegian islands pretty far north, um, a little bit over bits of Russia, but mostly uh, the land is not covered in ice except in Greenland and northern Canada. Most of the ice that's out there uh, has historically been floating on the water. Uh, and uh, as the water has warmed, uh, it has melted uh, and 
uh, done so at a faster, the Arctic has warmed at a faster rate uh, than, than other parts of the world. Uh, so it's, it's mostly an ocean surrounded by land. Great. Um, thanks, Zach, so much for you know a super informative uh, talk, and thank you, all of you who submitted questions. I'm going to bring Derek back on, who's going to uh, take us out into our day, and we will see all of you hopefully next week for our next great decisions. And um, again, uh, Zach, really, really appreciate your your time and your expertise. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Audience members, thank you so much for joining us today. Apologize for some of the uh, internet hiccups, uh, but really fascinating talk, Zach. Thank you for your great expertise. It was just wonderful to be able to have you join us today. Excellent questions, members. Uh, again, if you look in the chat, there are links to where you can uh, connect to the Foreign Policy Association website uh, to get the book and also to our website to get the International Speaker Series tickets. Um, we have our next talk is next Friday, same time, same channel. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Again, if you missed a previous talk, go to our YouTube uh, channel and you can catch it on, uh, on replay. All the best. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe in the snow. Bye-bye.